welcome. Um, welcome to our joint uh, CRS um, Temple University event. Um, I'm extremely happy to have our honored guests and to have Igata Sensei. Uh, I'm Robert Guzarek from Temple University, Japan. Uh, just one uh, item of um, housekeeping, if I may say. Uh, if you can keep yourselves muted until we go to Q&A. And also we are recording the introductory remarks and the discussion we'll have with the participants, but we won't record the, the Q&A. So without further ado, uh, I'll give the floor to Igata Sensei. Thank you, Robert. Uh, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Akira Igata, Executive Director of CRS or the Center for Rulemaking Strategies at Tama University. Uh, thank you all join, uh, Thank you for joining this virtual seminar on Japan in the age of Sino-American confrontation, which is co-hosted by ICAS or the Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies at Temple University Japan and CRS. Today, we'll be discussing various issues related to Japan's increasingly difficult position in managing its relationship with the US and China. In doing so, I'm glad to welcome two excellent panelists for this timely discussion. First, we have Shihoko Goto, who is the Deputy Director for Geoeconomics and Senior Northeast Asia Associate at the Woodlow Wilson Center's Asia Program. She specializes in trade and economic issues across Asia with a focus on Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. Before joining the Wilson Center, Goto-san has been a correspondent for Dow Jones News Services and United Press International based in Tokyo and Washington, covering global financial system as well as international trade. So she would be the perfect person to address the topics of this session. Uh, second, we have Tobias Harris, senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. He oversees the national security and international policy team's work on Asia. Now, you may remember him from his last year's book talk that ICAS and CRS co-hosted on his first ever English biography of Prime Minister Abe, the iconoclast Shinzo Abe and the New Japan. I certainly learned a lot in this last event, and I look forward to learning more again today. And then last but not least is a man who needs no introduction, Robert Dujarek, co-director of ICAS, who will be the moderator for this session. One administrative note, the working language of today's session will be English, but if there's anyone in the audience who's more comfortable speaking in Japanese, please feel free to type up your question in Japanese in the chat box during the Q&A session, and I'll translate it into English and ask the question on your behalf. Uh, Robert, thanks as always for co-hosting this event. I'll hand it over to you now. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Igata Sensei, uh, for the kind introduction. And um, I will start with a discussion with our panelists. And I think the first question to both Shioko and Tobias is really how bad are Sino-American relations? I mean, how do you see things? Um, I, guess I'll, I guess I'll kick things off. Um, Robert, thank you um, for hosting this to ICAS. Um, Igata-san, thank you for the introduction and, and for, to CRS for hosting this. Um, it really is a pleasure, and I, I cannot wait for the day that we can do this in person again. Um, so, uh, what's uh, can I? <laughs> yeah, let's hope for that day. Um, I mean, I, I I think it's it's actually a pretty uh, an easy question to answer, and that I mean it's very bad. I you know I think you have um, a situation now where perhaps the one thing America's two parties can agree on um, is that um, you know that that there needs to be a major course correction in the in the U.S. relationship with China. Um, you know, a, a consensus that there needs to be a more competitive approach to China. Uh, Kirk Campbell, who's the Indo-Pacific coordinator, the National Security Council made, has made that clear in several public appearances recently that, you know, competition is the watchword. We're seeing a lot of continuity uh, from the Trump administration to the Biden administration as far as China is concerned. We're seeing, I, I think, a different approach in terms of uh, the role that um, cooperation with allies is uh, is being given in the Biden administration's approach to Asia. But, uh, you know, that we are seeing um, continuity. And, and also, we're seeing that despite the fact that during the campaign, I mean, I think there was some rhetoric about the possibility that you could have areas of, of uh, negotiation and dialogue with China, most notably on climate. I don't think anyone is, is seeing those openings now. I mean, so there's very little room for, I think, uh, constructive engagement right now. Shioko? Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, first of all, thank, thank you so much for inviting uh, me to participate in this really incredibly timely discussion. 
um, there's a lot of ground to cover in that one question about how bad are things. Uh, yes, they are bad uh, in terms of bilateral relations, as Tobias said, but for the United States, it actually could come as a blessing. Um, it has acted as a unifier um, in the United States. Um, I'm based in Washington, DC, and I see firsthand just how divided this country is at the moment. But there is this great consensus when it comes to dealing with the China threat, and you see it on Capitol Hill as well. Um, earlier this month, we've seen um, you know, a bipartisan support for a massive um, spending act bill, um, the Innovation and Competition Act, um, which passed the Senate 68 to 32. It's promising $200 billion over the course of five years. To what end? Essentially to try to beat China at its own game. So it's uh, focusing on developing artificial intelligence technologies, semiconductors, robotics, um, quantum computing, all these things that have been outlined by Made in China 2025 um, and, and beyond. And so there is this um, ability for the United States to really uh, focus and say that this is going to be a challenge that the United States not only has to fight in words, but also in action and actually invest as well. Um, the United States has been complacent to date about its um, edge when it comes to technology and innovation. And there is, however, this realization that it cannot simply rest on its laurels and it really needs to step up um, to be able to not just keep its current position, but prevent it from slipping behind. Now, when we look at it from Japan's perspective, um, they, they, it is somewhat comforting. There had been concern that um, a Biden win would mean a reversal to a Obama-like position when it comes to China. That is to say that it would be much more dovish trying to reach across to China um, on, on certain issues, especially on issues like climate change, but also on other areas of potential cooperation as well. Um, and that um, has not been the case. So we've seen the Biden administration reverse a lot of the de decisions that have been made by the Trump administration, uh, for instance, on re-entering um, the Paris um, Climate Accord, uh, renegotiating uh, the Iran nuclear deal. But it, when it comes to Asia, and especially when it comes to China, um, the Biden administration really has stayed the course and actually intensified that hawkish stance when it comes to, to China. Thank you. So this brings me to, to another aspect of this which is what does the US expect from Japan when it comes to China, both in, in the military area, in the diplomatic arena, and also in the economics business area? So Japan, as you pointed out, Shioko is happy that uh, Biden is quote unquote tough on China, though I, I would argue that actually Obama's pivot was a, also a way of, of being um, hard on China. Uh, but what does, what does the US want from Japan to you and to Tobias afterwards? Um, if I may, um, when it comes to the Biden administration's expectations for Japan, I think um, expectations for Japan as a rule has really gone up. Um, it's gone up um, and it particularly increased with the withdrawal of the United States from the TPP with the Trump administration. Um, so there had been global expectations for Japan to really carry on some of the torch um, uh, that has been given away by the United States when it comes to ensuring free and fair trade in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, the Biden administration's expectation is for Japan to keep on doing that um, and do more. Um, so it expects Japan to really be almost its emissary in, in the region uh, when it comes to um, uh, adhering to American um, economic values um, and also to step up when it comes to um, ensuring stability um, in, in the region as well on the, on the military front. And we've seen this, for instance, um, as we see greater tension between mainland China and Taiwan, uh, there is greater expectation for Japan to actually be involved 
in um, ensuring um, the status quo in the um, in cross trade relations. Um, so there is a lot of expectation on, on uh, Japan to to be able to keep that role as as the uh, stabilizer of the region. The question is whether it actually has that ability to meet those challenges and those expectations, given the um, uneasy situation Japan finds itself domestically. Um, and I know Tobias um, can really expand on that. Tobias? Yeah, I mean, I just want to um, just pick up on a couple of points um, that Shioko made. I mean, I think, I mean, the first thing, I mean, there, there's a lot of continuity um, you know, from the Obama era where, you know, the, the I, I think there was an, a realization um, as the rebalance or the pivot uh, proceeded uh, that Japan really was the keystone, really the center um, to the success of that of that strategy and that the U.S. was going to look uh, a lot to Japan to really step up on a number of different fronts. And so all of that dates back to the Obama years. I mean, you saw you know, during Obama's second term, it'd be hard to find a period um, where you saw, I, I think, a more fertile period for U.S.-Japan cooperation, you know, between guidelines revision, um, TPP negotiations being completed, even though they couldn't get through Congress. Um, you know, it was, it was a very, I think, um, productive area. And I, I think um, those assumptions and those expectations uh, that the U.S. is going to be able to look to Japan, that Japan is going to play this role. One wrinkle, though, and one difference is that you know, in, in, in a lot of ways, it's hard to see the U.S. quite as the agenda setter in the same way that when you look at, for example, what the what the agenda looked like at the, the uh, bilateral meeting, the first meeting between uh, Biden and Suga back in April, and you looked at the joint statement, um, a lot of it is incorporating things that Japan in some ways has been doing on its own. I mean, you know, and we're now at a point where quality infrastructure, this program that Japan um, laid out um, during the during the 20 teens. Um, you know, it is now sort of a fixture in, you know, we saw it in the G7, right, you know, quite at length, um, you know, the Biden administration having its own sort of global infrastructure program. I mean, you know, these principles for quality infrastructure investment, mm -hmm. Japan, I think, worked very hard to articulate, um, are now, I mean, they're now just sort of standard, you know, to, to buy in the bilateral setting and also in a multilateral setting. Um, and so, I mean, I think we're seeing that Japan oh. is now really playing a role, um, particularly on the the econ um, development side, maybe less on the military side. I mean, where I think the ask is the same as it's been for 60 years, which is Japan needs to spend more, needs to integrate its forces more with the United States, uh, needs to be prepared to play more of a role in some of the contingencies like the Taiwan contingency that um, Shihoko mentioned. I think another specific ask, and Shihoko did not, I, I, I'm grateful that she left this there because I think it's, it's low hanging fruit. I mean, I think the thing, um, you know, probably the most specific concrete mm. ask from the Biden administration is that Japan and South Korea find a way to get through the issues they've had over the last couple of years and find a way, um, you know, not, not just to solve the issues, but I think to find a way to see that they have shared interests. I mean, I think that is under, ultimately, I think the, the issue, the point that they need to get to, um, oh. you know, and I think a recognition, you know, that oh. if, if, you know, the you know the U.S.'s main democratic allies in Northeast Asia uh, aren't able to talk to each no, other. No, you know no. this this idea of having a, an agenda, uh, a foreign policy approach that's based on cooperation among democracies isn't going to get you very far. And so, I mean, I think you know if there's a specific ask that they want from Japan, it's find a way to get through that. And and I don't think there's there's no uh, magic potion that's going to make them get along. And I think it's been frustrating so far. Uh, but I but that that I think would be um, high on the list. Yeah, and, and if I if I can sort of just add um, to that, um, the expectation for Japan is certainly to be a convener, uh, to be able to be a force multiplier. So Japan is, um, you know, the the most trusted ally that the United States has in the Indo-Pacific region. Therefore, it is tasked with this ability to reach out across uh, the region to garner. Uh, the support of like-minded countries. Um, obviously, the situation with South Korea is, is a tremendous uh, 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 block to that. Um, but at the same time, with Japan, the expectations for Japan too goes beyond that. And I think we've seen that um, with, with the latest G7 meeting as well. So you have Europe really involved in um, being engaged in the Indo-Pacific and that uh, the European perspective, perspective until quite recently had been to see China as a, a solid economic partner 
um, and solely as that economic partner. But over the last um, couple of years, we've seen uh, the implications of BRI actually going into continental Europe and um, leading to this divide within Europe, uh, between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. And it's led to um, Western Europe in particular to rethink its own, um, not just its China strategy, but a um, strategy for the broader Indo-Pacific region. And I'm thinking in particular about France. And of course, France, um, we don't really think about it in this way, but France um, sees itself very much as a Pacific power with um, uh, territorial um, uh, interests um, in, in the region and therefore and, and citizens in the region as well. And so in order to protect its overseas territories in the Indo-Pacific, it really has come into the Indo-Pacific uh, sphere. And Germany too has um, come up with a uh, more comprehensive um, Indo-Pacific plan as well. And these have really been encouraged by Japan. Uh, Japan is trying to bring in the UK as well. It's brought in the UK. It has been instrumental in bringing the UK into uh, the CPT CPTPP negotiations as well. So Japan, here's Japan. It has focused on reaching out to Southeast Asia, South Asia. Now it's turning also to continental Europe as well as to Britain and really working together with the United States to bring together these like-minded uh, countries to create a convoy of sorts to push back against the China threat. Thanks, thank you, Shirko. I think one question I would, uh, one point I would add to this, I think, and it's a challenge both of the US, the Europeans, everybody is, it's clear that Japan wants them, but it's obviously the US, but also the Europeans, the Australians to be involved, so less clear what Tokyo is willing to do in their own sphere. For example, um, Tokyo has been, let's say, very, very low key in terms of dealing with Russia. You know, after the attempted assassination in the UK, uh, you know, they're happy to see warships from like-minded countries in Japanese waters. It's unclear that they really would enjoy sending a Japanese ships, say, to the Black Sea. Uh, so I think the question that arises, something that you see when you have discussions uh, with officials from, from countries that see themselves as partners of Japan is what is Japan doing on its side to contribute to the security of its partners? And I think that's always the, there's always an imbalance there. Um, that's, a, that's an issue. Um, I what I would ask my kind of last set of questions would be before we go to the, to the audience is, you know, what does Japan want from the US when it comes to China that I think we've already partly addressed, but also what are the areas of American policy towards China that are most problematic for Japan? Because I think you've mentioned that there's a consensus in the US uh, that America should be quote unquote harder on China, but you know, Uniqlo, for example, found um, some of its goods impounded by US customs because they apparently came from uh, labor camps in Xinjiang. Uh, Japanese business is highly involved in China as is American business. Um, rising US um, Chinese tensions can force Japan and Japanese corporations to have to choose. Uh, and that's an issue for, for businesses worldwide, but perhaps even more for Japanese ones, given how close the, the ties are with China. I can, I can start first. I mean, to, I mean, to your question, I mean, human rights is obviously an area where, you know, and this has been a, a challenge for the US uh, and Japan uh, with regard to China specifically for a long time. I and mean, we look back at what happened um, in 1989 after uh, the Tian uh, Tiananmen Square massacre. I mean, th this is, you know, um, an area where Japan has always been reluctant to um, go too far. I mean, and, and it, you know, it's the same thing we saw uh, with regard to Russia after 2014, where you know Japan dragged its feet a bit um, and was quick to uh, re-engage with Russia more, you know, quicker than some of the others. Um, I'm reluctant to say too much on Russia with James. I see James Brown <laughs> staring at me on my screen, so I'm reluctant to say too much about Russia. But um, you know, this is this is just an area where um, you know, we know there's there's some daylight. Uh, we saw it recently when uh, the U.S. and its partners uh, imposed sanctions on China 
um, you know, in regard to Xinjiang and, and Japan was left out and claimed that they couldn't because they didn't have a Magnitsky style law, which may be the case, but it also, um, you know, there's not exactly a stampede right now to fix that. I mean, I know there's some agitation for it, but um, this does not seem to be something that the Suga government itself has uh, decided to push hard for. So, um, you know, human rights is going to be an issue. You have a, a democratic administration that I think is, um, you know, prepared to um, not just talk about human, human rights in a kind of lip service kind of way, but really to take it more seriously and, and to find ways uh, of pressuring China on that front and to make, you know, make it a higher uh, priority on its agenda with China. And so I think that um, is at least a potential source of friction. I mean, I, I think we can overstate that, though. Um, you know, that there does seem to be, um, I think, some understanding from the Biden administration regard to, you know, with regard to every one of its um, allies and partners when it comes to China, you know, that every, you know, every country in, relation, in its relationship with China sits in a different place and is going to bring different concerns and different priorities to the table. And I think there is some, some flexibility. Um, I mean, I guess maybe even just, um, maybe this is a little provocative, but I want to put it out there as, as a potential issue for Japan as far as um, the US and China are concerned. And that is maybe just a, a, a problem that the US often in its foreign policy doesn't do subtlety very well. And I think, you know, we're in a situation where the relationship with China does require, I think, a lot of subtlety, which Japan, I think, understands, you know, that, you know, they have been managing to walk a tightrope for a long time. Um, you've had deep business engagement at the same time as you've had business pursuing a China plus one strategy for um, almost 15 years now. I mean, you know, that there is an understanding um, that you can compartmentalize some of the difficult parts of the relationship, uh, that you need to keep channels of communication open, that, you know, you have uh, pipe blue between, you know, Japanese leaders and, and Chinese leaders. Um, and I, you know, I, I certainly have concerns that uh, Washington, you know, in the stampede to um, be kind of tougher than thou on, on China, that there's just not um, the ability to have the kind of um, flexibility, subtlety, caution, um, you know, both rhetorically and in policy terms and, and the kind of fine tuning um, that Japan and a lot of other countries that find themselves between China and the United States are able to do. And, and so I think um, just in the big picture, I think that's a, a potential source of friction um, over the long term, not just with Japan, but with, I think with you know, South Korea and pretty much every other country in the region. Yeah. Um, so so um, one of the questions is obviously going to be about um, dealing with that China challenge of cooperation versus uh, competition. And many have argued that Japan has been doing this with regarding China for a very long time. And many would argue that it has been doing so successfully. And if that is the case, then can Japan be that model for dealing with, with China? So you, you decouple uh, the economic relations with the security concerns um, and you uh, keep away human rights issues um, from the more real politic, um, uh, more immediate concerns uh, that the two countries uh, may, may want to, to deal with. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that this decoupling is becoming increasingly difficult, and it's not just coming from the United States. Um, we haven't really talked about this, but China itself is changing. Um, China under Xi has become much more assertive and much more aggressive. Um, the America has changed considerably since the um, advent of Trump, uh, the, and technology has changed considerably um, over the past decade. Um, China's ambitions have changed, uh, global expectations for China to confirm to the international liberal order, that's gone by the wayside. And that's not because of anything that Washington has decided, it has come as a result of the actions um, that are taken by China. So even if Japan, we were to say that Japan had mastered this ability to be able to meet the China challenge by being able to ma manage this very delicate balance, uh, looking at the way forward, that's going to be an increasingly precarious situation for any country. Japan's strategy, I believe, moving forward is going to be to look for uh, more pragmatic uh, issue by issue, case by case, mini deals. So instead of having grand alliances or grand partnerships, you actually work together uh, with countries um, on, on issue by issue. Um, and, and that could be good, uh, but it's also not going to satisfy um, a partner like, like Washington. It'll be very difficult, especially as Tobias said, uh, the United States doesn't do subtlety um, all that well. Um, one 
other thing about um, human rights, Xinjiang, of course, we also have the situation in Myanmar, Burma. Um, and what's interesting now is that um, values-based diplomacy has never been something that Japan has really focused on, but increasingly uh, Tokyo is expected to play by those norms, especially uh, from both the United States as well as Europe. Um, being put into that uncomfortable position um, in Asia where it has such vested interests, especially in a country like, like Myanmar, um, Tokyo is going to have an an incredibly difficult time. However, when it comes to um, this Myanmar situation in particular, uh, there is greater understanding in Washington. Washington tends to look at it, uh, the, uh, the situation much more in a humanitarian uh, governance perspective, whereas the Japanese perspective is much more about the business and the economic interests that it has in the, in the region. And there's an ability for Washington and Tokyo to uh, be more accommodative of each other's needs. So my hope is that um, those kinds of needs, there will be greater flexibility with the, um, given that there is a bigger issue, uh, a, a bigger objective for the two countries to actually be working together on, that is to say, to meet the China challenge. Robert, before we go into, um, can I just add just one point, just something that, that Shoko said just sort of a that struck me and, and um, actually I don't remember exactly what point it was, but I think it's something that's worth raising about um, the Japan-China relationship going forward and, and sort of the um, one issue that I think makes it hard to kind of know exactly what direction. And that is um, kind of personnel and how foreign policy is made in both countries. And you know, Shoko was talking about how she's China is different. I mean, I think, you know, this is now a, a government that is much more um, centralized, which, you know, I think you, you, you worry, does that make it more brittle? Does it make it harder? Um, you know, there's less feedback, so there's less um, course correction. Um, on the Japan side, um, you know, I, when I was, I was working on this essay for foreign affairs about, you know, Japan um, not being able to go quite as far as the United States and competing with China. And I, and I think that's true, but I do, um, one, I think, uncertainty about the future is that it's not exactly clear who the China school is in Japan right now. Um, you know, that, that um, you know, we know sort of the older generation, the LDP had China hands, Komeito has China hands, um, within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, not as much as there used to be. Um, so, you know, so, so are you going to have people in positions of authority who have the same connection to the Chinese leadership, um, who are going to be able to uh, kind of lubricate the relationship, uh, prevent some of these friction points. And that, I mean, that's just an open question going forward. I mean, I, of course, in the business community, those relationships are there and they'll be a source um, of, of connectivity between the, uh, Japan and China. But I mean, are there going to be the same, um, the same interpersonal relations between decision makers in the two capitals? And I, and I think that's a reason for worry um, and, you know, a potential uh, uh, point, I guess, I guess uh, a fault line that could push them apart. Thank you, uh, Tobias. Uh, I think Gata Sensei, you had a few words to say, and then we'll go to Q and A. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, so, on this issue of Japan's human rights policies, I want to share with you some of the latest developments here in Tokyo. Since I have been working closely on this issue with many of the politicians and parties during this diet session, um, I think that both uh, Harris, uh, Tobias, and Goto-san is right. Uh, Japan has been taking a relatively low-profile policies in terms of human rights for decades, but uh, I am seeing a very slow change here in Tokyo not so much within the executive branch of the government, but especially among Diet members or the legislative branch. Um, for example, the ruling Liberal Democratic Party has recently created a, a project team on human rights diplomacy, and they came out with a recommendation on Japan's new human rights diplomacy a couple of weeks ago. And in this, they include uh, issues such as the importance for Japan to begin considering creating a sanctions law or the so-called Magnitsky Act or Human Rights Violations Sanctions Act in this recommendation. They also talk about the importance of creating a some kind of a supply chain human rights due diligence laws to protect Japanese businesses from cases like what we have seen with Uniqlo. Um, and it's not just the LDP. You look at the Democratic Party for the people, the biggest opposition party, and they are also saying that, look, we need to start considering both the sanctions law and this uh, uh, supply chain human rights due diligence law. And so is the a uh, little bit of a smaller opposition party, the Constitutional Democratic Party, which actually came out with a draft law 
on supply chain human rights due diligence law, saying that we need to create this uh, three pillar law, which includes uh, making sure that Japanese government remove forced labor from their uh, government procurement. It also talks about supporting the Japanese private business in complying with some of the human rights due diligence, um, uh, human rights due diligence issues, and um, asking these companies to be more transparent about their uh, acts, their supply chains, and making sure that they create a human rights annual report and uh, make it uh, uploaded on the uh, on their website. Um, and then in addition to that, there's now a nonpartisan parliamentary group uh, that's working on these human rights issues, calling for the need for Japan to pass a Human Rights Violations Act. And uh, shameless self-promotion here, um, there's actually going to be a seminar uh, tomorrow or in two days um, at the Tokyo University where there's an expert from the EU, Australia, and Japan yours truly, uh, who would be the keynote speaker talking about the uh, what's the latest situation is in Japan, EU, and Australia with regards to this human rights violation law. And I have just pasted the link here, so please register if you're interested. Thanks.